Well, welcome to our midweek service tonight. I'm glad that you're able to be with us and uh, trust that you're doing okay. And a uh, lot's going on right now, and uh, we certainly need to be in prayer. We're going to take time to pray here in just a few moments. So let's begin tonight by just singing a couple choruses together. I think everybody knows, Jesus, we just want to thank you, and we'll do that together. And then we'll have some time for prayer requests and then uh, pray. And I encourage you, uh, if you haven't yet, grab a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen and your Bible so that you'll be ready when we start our study tonight. And you can write down some of these prayer requests as well. And then when we finish here with the study tonight, you can take time with your family or individually to pray over these requests. And so let's go ahead and we'll sing this chorus together. Jesus, we just want to thank you. And we do. Hey, listen, all the things that are going on right now doesn't lessen the fact that we have much to thank the Lord for. And I trust that you'll keep that kind of attitude at heart during these difficult days. Jesus, we just want to thank you. Jesus, we just want to thank you. Jesus, we just want to thank you. Thank you for being so good. Jesus, we just want to praise you. Jesus, we just want to praise you. Jesus, we just want to praise you. Praise you for being so good. Jesus, we just want to tell you. Jesus, we just want to tell you. Jesus, we just want to tell you we love you for being so good. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He loves me so. Church in years past, and Brother Martin's wife 
is now at home on hospice care. Uh, she was in the hospital. They did not think she would make it, uh, but she has had a, I don't want to call it a recovery, but uh, she is now at home and she'll be under hospice care until the Lord takes her home. So at least for her husband, it's, it's a blessing to have her there by his side. So if you would pray for Shirley, that as she prepares to go to be with the Lord, that God would comfort her and that God would comfort her husband and her whole family as well. And then I know a lot of you are interested about Katie and Naomi. Right now, she is at UHC and she has begun the process of delivering Naomi. And uh, as, a, as far as I know at this moment, it still hasn't been completed yet, but she is on the way to bringing Naomi into the world. So if you would pray for Katie and Naomi's safety. And then we have mentioned for the last couple weeks about Dave Swigert. We've been praying for him. And as we mentioned last Sunday, he did pass away. And so just ask you to continue to remember his wife, Tammy, and their family. Remember Harold and Dottie, that they'd be able to wisely minister to the Swigert family. Uh, we need to be in prayer, obviously, for our president. We need to be in prayer for our vice president. We need to be in prayer that God would give them wisdom through this pandemic and of course for our nation uh, there's nothing wrong with praying for safety there's nothing wrong with invoking the scripture and I'm doing that on a daily basis and uh, we have not because we ask not and that's the reality and if God uh, does not you know decide to answer our prayer in the very means that we would ask uh, at least we'll know that what has happened was not because of our lack of prayer so we encourage you to be in prayer that God would do a special work and that while this is going on, we would just not look to a medical deliverance. We would not look to a government deliverance, but there would be a genuine turning to the Lord among many people. Uh, I don't know if you uh, happen to see a, a rose garden, uh, not a ceremony, but a, a time where men were speaking in regards to helping get uh, some of our companies geared to produce medical equipment. One of those men was Mike Lindell. Uh, he is famous for MyPillow. And uh, Mr. Lindell, when he stood in front of the cameras, spoke about getting back to the Lord, uh, reading our Bibles. And uh, of course, he has been basically Know, excoriated by our media for doing those things and invoking God and even speaking about separation of church and state and all this junk that our mainline media has uh, placed upon this country. And so uh, our nation is not right. Our nation is far from God. Our nation needs to see God move. And if God can use this to bring glory to himself and to cause people to turn to him, we need to be praying that way. And so I just want to encourage you, as you pray, don't just pray for a physical deliverance. I mean, we all want that. In our, in our flesh, we want, we want that. But let's pray that God will use this for good. So I'm going to take a moment to pray and so you can join with me. And then again, when we finish our Bible study tonight, there in your homes, I want to encourage you to take some time to pray over these matters and other things that the Lord may bring to your mind tonight. Father, I thank you for being faithful. I thank you for being good. I thank you for being gracious and kind and long-suffering and gentle and patient. And you have, Father, shown great patience toward this nation. You have been very merciful to us. You have blessed us and we have taken it for granted. And a nation that was once founded and anchored in uh, a true attitude of belief is now uh, a very secular, a very godless society. I thank you for those who still stand for truth, but our nation is far from where it once was. We have never been a perfect nation. There's never been a time where we have always done everything right. But if it had not been for you, this nation would have been far worse. This nation uh, 
would have been uh, under judgment much sooner. I, I just I thank you that there were many in this nation who sought to please you. And I do ask for a return for that. I ask, Lord, that there would be repentance, that there would be many who are brought to Christ, that there are many Christians who come to get their hearts right, and that there even be revival in this land. I don't know your full plan, don't even pretend to know, but I do know that whenever you allow anything into our life, it is for the purpose of causing us to look to you. And I would ask that for our nation. Lord, I would ask for physical deliverance, and I think especially of our own church family. Lord, you are the God of healing. You tell us that you forgive all our iniquities and heal. You forgive all our iniquities and heal all our diseases. You tell us that you are the God that healeth us. You tell us the prayer of faith shall save the sick. So I know there is nothing wrong with asking for deliverance, and Lord, we would ask for that. We know the need of every family. It's not just battling the coronavirus, but so many of our folks have physical uh, ailments that only you can touch. And we've mentioned these tonight, uh, Don and Mary Ann, and mentioned Katie and Naomi in that delivery process. Lord, we mentioned those grieving tonight, uh, the, the Swiger family. We just ask, Lord, that you would work in a special way that only you can do. We have no power in ourselves to do these things, but we do look to you. And I ask that you would be pleased to work to glorify your name, that's the bottom line, that your name would be glorified. And so now, Father, as we uh, take a little bit of time to look into your word tonight, as we continue this character study, that you would use it for good, that it would be blessed of you, and Lord, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll be singing one more chorus before we actually get into the study tonight. Uh, most of you know the song, I, I, I love this little chorus, it's called Open My Eyes, Lord. And so we'll sing that together, and then we'll look into God's Word tonight. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to Bibles tonight, and if you would, I want you to turn uh, first to the book of 2 Kings, the book of 2 Kings, and we'll be looking toward the end of that uh, book in just a moment. As you know, we've been in a uh, series on Wednesday nights looking at different men and women of the Word of God. The last couple of Wednesday nights, we've been studying the life of Esther, and tonight we're going to be looking at a new individual. Uh, not new as far as his historically, but uh, new in our study, and that is the life of Hezekiah, who was uh, one of the great kings of Judah. Now, I'm going to give you, a, if you would, a summa summation of his life before we begin to look at some uh, background into his times uh, as he's brought to light in Scripture. And I begin, you don't have to turn there, but let me read from 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verses 20 and 21. Again, I, I consider this like a summation of the life and the reign of Hezekiah. It says, And thus did Hezekiah throughout all Judah, and wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord his God. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God and in the law, and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all his heart and prospered. And I just point out to you some statements made in these two verses that uh, tell us of the delight that God had in this man. This was a man that the Bible says wrought or worked good, and his life was filled with those things that were right, and he exemplified and lived truth. It also says that he was a man that was attached to the house of God 
served it well. He was one who listened to the law and to the commandments. And in the process of seeking God in his life, he did it with all his heart. Now that's a pretty good summation to any life. Uh, anyone who would aspire to be like Hezekiah would aspire to be uh, like a man with uh, the touch of God in his life, a man who was greatly esteemed of God. And so uh, he would not be a bad example to follow at all. He'd be a great example for your life. Now, what we're going to do tonight as we begin to look at the life of Hezekiah is just again look at some of the background into Hezekiah's life. The first thing I want you to know is Hezekiah began to reign in the southern kingdom of Israel, which you know is Judah. And he reigned for 29 years. He began his rule at the age of 25 and ruled for 29 years, passed away at the age of 54. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Uh, what makes one individual choose to go toward God while others despise God. I don't uh, know what you may think, but by all rights, when you look at Hezekiah's environment, when you look at not only the environment of his nation or the political climate, and you look at his family, by all rights, I think it would be fair to say that Hezekiah could have and maybe even should have rejected God because that is what was going on around him. The condition of Hezekiah's nation and his family was not good. So tonight that's where our focus is going to be before we actually begin to look directly at Hezekiah's life and why he became such a champion for God. I want you to see that condition, that background, that environment that Hezekiah found himself in. First, I want to look at the environment of the nation as a whole. And I mentioned we were going to start there. I said, I think Second Kings, if, if I did, let me just reverse course a little bit. And I'm going to have you turn to what would seem like an unlikely place to start the study of the life of Hezekiah, and that is to the book of Isaiah. And I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. And we're going to read the first nine verses of that first chapter. And this is the reason why. Look at the first verse. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Isaiah the great prophet was a contemporary of Hezekiah. And this is what Isaiah had to say. This was his assessment of the nation of Judah during the days of Hezekiah. Verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. A oh, simple nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away back. Why should ye be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. You hear that? Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate, as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Now that is not the kind of comparison that you want your nation compared to. Isaiah compared his own people to Sodom and Gomorrah. And we understand who Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, what it was and who they were, 
We understand uh, their immorality. We understand the great judgment that God brought upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and how God destroyed them. Isaiah said, you rank right up with Sodom and Gomorrah. And had not God in his mercy delivered, a, as he said, a very small remnant of Judah. He said, you would have been right with Sodom and Gomorrah in total extinction. But God in his mercy delivered a small remnant of the house of Judah. Now, during the days of Hezekiah, he himself was righteous, but the people were not. There's an interesting passage uh, in the book of Micah. Micah was also a contemporary of Hezekiah. He was one of the great prophets in Judah at that day. And I want you to go back with me to the book of Micah toward the end of the Old Testament. And I'm going to read here, we're looking at the condition, the, the environment that Hezekiah found himself in. And I'm going to begin here in Micah chapter 1. I'm going to read the first five verses. The word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Morashite, in the day of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, O all, all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is. And let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him, and the valley shall be cleft as wax before the fire, and as water that are poured out down a steep place. For the transgressions of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? And what I'm pointing out is this. These two men, Isaiah and Micah, who were the preachers of their day, they were the great prophets, said about the nation of Judah that they were steeped in sin, that they were spiritually in decline and had walked away from God. Does that sound familiar? I think our country has been in that condition for quite some time. These men pointed out the condition, the environment that Hezekiah was brought up in. An interesting statement is made in Micah chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, if you'd like to follow along. Micah chapter 3, verse 10. They build up Zion with blood, and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Therefore shall Zion for your sakes be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps in the mountain of the house of the high places of the forest. And that's exactly what would happen to Judah a number of years after Hezekiah would pass away. Judgment would befall the nation of Judah. They would go into captivity. Uh, multitudes of people would die and a very small remnant would survive. Now, having said all those things, I want you to notice some interesting statements here in Micah chapter 3. He said, concerning the condition of the nation, the environment of the nation, he said, the heads thereof judge for reward. The heads, those in political power, whether it be a judge or whether it be uh, you know, a high-ranking official within the government. He said that the priests taught for hire. In other words, they were in for money. And the prophets, they divine for money as well. In other words, they weren't doing it for God's sake. They weren't there to please the Lord. They were in it for themselves. Now, this is not an accusation against every pastor, but you are well aware that many who are called ministers have no use for God. I sat down with a Baptist pastor several years ago 
And he told me, I don't believe in the resurrection. I don't believe in the virgin birth. I don't believe in the blood atonement. Near our church is a, is a minister of another denomination who has uh, very boldly stated that they do not believe in the virgin birth of Christ or the blood atonement or the resurrection. Don't believe what the word of God says in reality. Uh, I remember several years ago here on our church grounds, I was the assistant pastor back in the 90s and there was a workman working on one of our air conditioning units and uh, I just went and began to talk with him and uh, try to give him the gospel and in the midst of the conversation we found out that he was I don't remember after all these years whether he was a saved man but he was a religious man and he attended a church here in the state of West Virginia in the southern part of the state and uh, he began to tell me that there church had just been assigned a new pastor. He was in a denomination where the, the hierarchy will bring people in and place them in churches. And so this man had been assigned this particular church and one of his first weeks on a Wednesday evening, which really almost surprised me that that church even had a Wednesday night or midweek service, but they did. And he said, when we came for a midweek service, uh, the people assembled and we waited a few moments for our pastor to begin the service and he never he never arrived. So one of the leaders in the church uh, thought maybe he saw the lights of the pastor's office on, so he went back to the pastor's study. Then he said there in the pastor's office was his pastor with uh, his feet kicked up on the table, you know, leaning back in his easy chair, uh, a pipe, you know, smoking a pipe there in his mouth. And, and the gentleman walked into the pastor's office and he said, well, Pastor, you know, this is our, our regular Bible study night and you know, we're ready for you to come. And that pastor looked at that man and said, I don't do Wednesday nights. Obviously, he was not in it to be pleasing to the Lord. That man was not in it to be pleasing and minister to his people. And I'm saying to you, I think in our, our society today, Many, not all, praise the Lord, but there are those who uh, are not in it to please God. They don't believe the truth of the Bible. Uh, they would as much just preach social justice as they would the cross of Christ. And so uh, that condition that now seems to fill our land certainly was the case with Israel then. They said their judges were corrupt. And many times, you know, we distrust our government, we distrust our court systems uh, because we see, we see corruptness. And that was the case uh, there in Judah, and it brought about their demise, it brought about judgment by God upon those people. And here is Hezekiah, and he is growing up in that environment. Now, several years later, after Isaiah and Micah pass off the scene, God raised up another prophet, and this prophet was contemporary with the last few kings of Judah, men like Jeconiah and Zedekiah. His name was Jeremiah. And I'm going to read a passage out of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah refers to what Micah had said years previous. In fact, that verse that we read in Micah chapter 3, verse 12, Jeremiah uses that passage in uh, speaking about Hezekiah. In Jeremiah chapter 26, the 18th verse, Jeremiah is speaking about these past events, and he says, Micah, the Moreshkite, prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spake to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountain of the house as the high places of a forest. So really the exact wording that Micah had, had spoken many years previous is repeated here by Jeremiah. But what's interesting is what's found in verse 19. He said, Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him at all to death? Did he not fear the Lord and he sought the Lord, and the Lord repented him? of the evil which he had pronounced against them. So Jeremiah says, you know, years ago, this prophet Micah spoke out against the things that had brought Judah to their great demise. 
their spiritual demise. He spoke against those things. He said, in the days of Micah was a king by the name of Hezekiah. And instead of getting upset at that which had been pronounced against them, instead of acting with pride saying, you have no right to you know, speak these words of condemnation toward our society, Hezekiah accepted those words and was challenged himself to have an attitude of humility and repentance. Now, this is the condition that Hezekiah found himself in. This is the condition of his nation, the, if you will, the environment that he grew up in. Not only did he grow up in an environment nationally that had turned against God, but his own family, his own family had an environment that was anti-God. His father was Ahaz, and I had asked you earlier to turn to 2 Kings, and so we'll go back there. 2 Kings, and we're going to go to the 16th chapter. 2 Kings chapter 16. And here we're introduced to the father of Hezekiah, and again, his name is Ahaz. I'm going to begin to read there in verse 1. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, and that was the king of Israel, or the, the northern kingdom, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. Now, it mentions David being his father. Now, this is about thirteen generations removed from the time of David. Uh, you won't see men referred to as grandfather or great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather. Uh, anyone who came before you in the lineage was just considered your father. And so, as the writer writes here, he says, I just want you to know that Ahaz was nothing like David. Ahaz was nothing like David. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a man who, when he sinned, repented. This was not the way Ahaz was. He did not do the things that were right. Notice verse 3. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son to pass through the fire according to the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. So Ahaz reverted back to the very thing that God had destroyed the inhabitants of the land of Palestine all those centuries before. When God destroyed the Hittites and the Amorites and, and so forth, when God wiped those people out, basically, it was because of their gross sin. And one of those gross sins was putting their own children to death. Does that sound familiar? Our society has been guilty of putting to death our own children, millions and millions of children over the years. Now, I'm glad to say, praise the Lord for it, there has been an effort by many Christians, many people who, who are pro-life to try to change the course of our nation. There has been some success, and yet this nation is still guilty of the blood of millions of children, just as Judah had become. I'm going to read to you out of 2 Chronicles. If you'd like to turn there, you can. In 2 Chronicles chapter 28, it expands on this thought. It gives us a little more detail into Hezekiah's father, Ahaz. In 2 Chronicles 28, verse 3, the Bible says, Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom. The valley of Hinnom was uh, directly outside the city walls of Jerusalem. It became a place where the following took place. Here in verse 3 it says, And burnt his children in the fire after the abomination of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Now, why does one reference say he burnt his son, and the other says his children? I, I have this as a, just a personal thought, that the first time he did such a heinous act, it was a shock to all who saw it. 
that you could actually take your own child and put that child to death and feel justified in the name of religion of all things. There are even some now who are promoting abortion by means of religion. I, that, that just blows my mind and it should trouble you greatly that that mindset can even accompany religion now as though it is proper and right. Now, in Second Chronicles, it says he burnt his children. I think the difference is simply this, that the writer of Second Kings saw what was done and there is an attitude of shock. I cannot believe he just sacrificed his son. Now, obviously this wasn't his son Hezekiah, but one of his sons. And later on it just became a practice that Ahaz, as well as the people, because the people would begin to practice this terrible thing, and they became callous to it, just like our society has become callous to, a, to the death of children in the form of abortion. And now we're even willing to consider putting children to death outside the womb. A child is born alive, let them be put to death. And quite frankly, we already know it is a fact. It's not conjecture. We know that it's already happening in abortion clinics. Now, when we look here at verses 4 and 5 of 2 Chronicles 28, he sacrificed also burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So a nation that had once offered only sacrifice to the Lord God of Israel, only in the place that he designated the temple, in Jerusalem. Now their own king has led the people into uh, false pagan worship. Verse 5, Wherefore the Lord has God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him, and carried away a great multitude of them captives, and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. This man led his people into sin, and it not only cost him, but he would cost the lives of many of his people. He would bring not only himself into spiritual uh, defeat, but he would lead his people into spiritual defeat. One last verse here in 2 Chronicles 28, in verse 19. For the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he made Judah naked and, trans and transgressed sore against the Lord. The nation of Judah sinned, according to this passage, because Ahab or Ahaz led them in that direction. Now, when those people stand before God one day, they will not uh, be judged because of Ahaz's actions. They'll be judged for their own individual actions lifestyles and actions. However, Ahaz had great influence over them. Now, just as Ahaz, as the Word of God tells us here in verse 19, God brought Judah low because of Ahaz, the king, and because he made his own people naked, and he caused his own people to transgress, can you imagine living in that home? Now, we're talking about a man's influence politically and spiritually over an entire nation. But those folks did not live within the home of Ahaz. But there was a young man who did, his name was Hezekiah. And we already know, as we read earlier out of 2 Chronicles, that Hezekiah did not follow the path of his father. I want to make this statement to you before we close tonight. Just because everyone around you even those possibly in your own family might despise God and give themselves to do evil does not mean that you have to follow suit. You do not have to do the same. Yet, we find people using that as an excuse. One other place I want you to look at tonight before we finish, and it is found in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Now we're just laying groundwork before we actually begin to look at Hezekiah himself. But again, I want you to see the environment that Hezekiah grew up in. 
And knowing already that he turned out to be a champion for God, the question is how in the world could anyone in that kind of environment ever become what he became? Well, the good news is it's possible. And if you have an environment, and we certainly have that kind of environment in our nation now, you certainly know that there are many in their homes who have that kind of environment, you do not have to go that direction. Notice here in Ezekiel chapter 18, and I'm going to begin to read in verse 14. Now, lo, if he begat a son that seeth all his father's sins which he hath done, and considereth, and doeth not such like, that hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that hath taken off his hand from the poor, and hath not received usury nor increase, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. Now let me just pause here for a moment. That which we just read could easily be applied to a father and his son. The father Ahaz and his son Hezekiah. Now look at verse 19. Yet ye say, why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? Now, I want you to stop for a moment and think about this. Hezekiah is born into a family that just by their, their status, as royalty, certainly lived with a, a great amount of pleasure. Can you imagine being brought up, you know, the old saying, with a silver spoon in your mouth, given, given all the advantages that life could offer as the son of royalty, and how difficult it would be to think about the possibility of forfeiting that uh, just to be right. In other words, Hezekiah brought up in that atmosphere and assuming as most children would that, you know, we're, where we're at, uh, because of what my father does, therefore, I don't want to change the culture around here. I want to pursue the culture. My dad, you know, put some of his children to death. Well, at least it's not me. And I, you know, I'll probably follow suit. You know, my dad worships you know, outside the temple and has desecrated the temple and worships pagan gods, and he seems to be getting along fine. I'll do the same thing. Hezekiah could have easily taken that mentality, as many do. But when I read here in Ezekiel chapter 18, especially verse 21, it says, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. In other words, it is possible for people who have this terrible environment, whether it's in the home, or in the community, or even in the nation, it is possible for them to turn somewhere along the line. Hezekiah, who had been influenced by his father, to at least consider going the wrong direction as his father had done, made a calculating decision not to go that direction. And I'm saying to you, you and I can do the same thing. We cannot blame our home life. We cannot blame the nation. We cannot blame some religious system that maybe has not stood for the truth of God's word. We cannot blame others 
when we see the wickedness of what goes on in the environment around us, we can choose to do right. You know, we're told that we are a product of our environment. And I don't discount that, that, you know, we are going to be affected by our environment. I uh, read a little bit about Harold Korshansky, uh, who is considered to be one of the fathers of environmental psychology. He was uh, the head of the graduate school at City University of New York. He wrote several books on the subject. And I don't discredit uh, anything that he uh, discovered. I don't discredit the fact that people do become products of their environment. But what we have done with that kind of psychology is not make people necessarily a product of their environment, but a victim of their environment. And we justify people. If you grew up in a drug dealer's home, then we assume, obviously, you're going to be a drug dealer. And instead of saying you ought not to live that lifestyle, we almost pamper people. And that's crept in to a lot of lives. And even within the Christian realm, we've allowed that to, to direct the way we go and to justify the wrong that we often do. You know, if you grew up in a home where uh, there was spousal abuse, hey, the reason I'm doing this is because this was my environment. And, and we seem to want to make the person a victim instead of saying, okay, this was a product of your environment, but you can change. Hezekiah did. Hezekiah did not follow the footsteps of his father, and nor do you or I have to follow those steps. I'm not speaking of picking yourself up by the bootstrap and turning over a new leaf, but I'm saying to you, when you recognize these facts, and if there is a desire to change, here is my encouragement to you. Follow the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know him as your personal Savior, that you put your faith in him. Turn from your sins. Turn from being a product or victim of your environment and say, I know this isn't right, and I, I want God, you, to take these sins and cleanse them and forgive me, and I want you to allow your Holy Spirit to enter into me and give me victory. And God, as you point things out to me, how to overcome, that I would take those steps to overcome and not allow myself just to be a victim of my environment. You may be a Christian, and as you're listening, you realize that you've bought into that lie. Maybe tonight, you just need to go before the Lord and say, God, I repent. God, I'm your child, and now I choose to repent of playing the victim's card and justifying the, the wrong way I think. You know, I was abused as a child, therefore, you know, I'm going to go around with this a victim's mentality. Listen, repent of those things. You don't have to stay in that state. And here's a great example, Hezekiah. And next week we'll begin to look at his life. Uh, I don't know how long this may take us. Maybe it won't take long at all. But I'll tell you what, I would encourage you to uh, read about Hezekiah and benefit from it. We'll come back on next Wednesday night and continue to look at this great man's life. All right there, let's just bow our heads together for prayer as we close tonight. And as you bow your heads, if you aren't certain that you've ever given your life to Jesus Christ, you don't know that you're saved, can I encourage you right now just to call on him, just ask him to forgive your sin and save you, believe him, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what the jailer said to Paul. He said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul didn't say, you got to join a church, you got to get baptized, you got to go out and, you know, live some life of, you know, philanthropy. No, it was just, you need to believe what God has done for you by his son, Jesus Christ on Calvary. Put your faith in him. Let him save you. If you have never done that, I encourage you right now to bow your head and call upon him. It doesn't matter where you're at. Anytime it's necessary, you call to him, he'll save you. And if, if you are a believer tonight and you've allowed yourself to buy into this victim's mentality, I trust you'll repent of that as well. And ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to give you victory. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you 
for what your word teaches us. I ask, Lord, that you would make a great change in me, and it has, and I ask you to continue to change me. And I ask, Lord, that maybe someone tonight that doesn't know you will get saved. God, do these works, and we'll thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You have a good evening. Good night.